Debouncing and throttling are great ways to not only improve your user experience, but also save yourself quite a bit of money. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to use debounce and throttling in JavaScript, as well as comparing the differences between them. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about throttle and debounce and why they're important to understand. So to get started, I have a basic index.html file, which just has a text input, as you can see on the right hand side here. It has a default tab, which we can put some text inside of, a debounce section, which some text we can add, and a throttle section where we can add some text, just so we can compare the differences between the default behavior, debounce behavior, and throttle behavior. I also have all of those elements selected so we can actually work with them. The first thing I want to talk about is how we can actually see the differences between debounce throttle and why they're important. Let's take our input element and I want to add an event listener for whenever our input changes. So anytime that we type anything into our input, this event listener is going to run. And all I want to do is I want to take our default text and I want to set the text to the value of our input. So what this is going to do is every time I type something, you can see it shows up in this default section down here. Now, when you're just working locally on your computer, this works fine. I mean, this is super quick. It's not going to cause any performance problems. It doesn't matter what your network connection is. And that's just because we're just storing everything locally in our page. What happens if, let's say this is like an autocomplete box and I start typing something and what it does is actually goes to the server and queries a bunch of information to say, hey, give me everything that you know has sad in the name, for example. And then it brings you back a list. So imagine you're like querying a movie database and you want to find all the movies with the name Matrix in them. Well, what it's going to do is as you type each character, it's going to send a brand new request because this event gets fired every single time you type a character. So when I type M, it's going to make a request for all the movies that start with M. Then when I hit A, it's now going to look for all the movies that have MA in them and then T and R and I and X. And just by typing out the word matrix, we made six requests to our server, which are all going to come back at different rates. And that is not only going to cause some UI problems, but also that's a huge burden for the people using your code because now they just made six network requests down loaded them and if they're on a slow connection or using data that's going to burn through their data and it's going to really slow down the app if their connection is not quick enough to keep up this is where debouncing and throttling come in really useful they are there as a way to actually slow down a function instead of calling a function every single time what it's going to do is it's only going to call that function after a set delay and that delay is going to be different based on debouncing and throttling they have a different way of working so the way that debounce works is instead of running the function every single time that you do something, so in our case, every time we type a character, it's going to run the function. Instead, what happens is it says, hey, has there been a delay since the last time you tried to call this function? So when I type S, it's going to call the function, but it's going to wait. It's going to wait, let's say one second. And as long as nothing changes in that one second, then the function will run. But if during that one second, I type another character, well, it's going to say, okay, something has changed reset our timer back to one second and wait to see if anything has changed. If I type another character in that one second, it resets again. Essentially, debounce waits until there's been at least a set period of time, in our case, one second, before it actually calls the function. So let's look at implementing a debounce version of this. We'll come in here, we'll create a function called debounce. And the way this debounce function is going to work is I'm gonna pass it a callback function, I'm gonna pass it a delay, and our just delay is gonna be defaulted to one second. And inside of here, what we want to do is we want to call this callback function after the delay as long as we haven't recalled our debounce in the past. And the way this debounce function works is we give it a function inside of it. So what we can do is we can say like update debounce text is going to be the function we create. And we're going to call debounce and we're going to pass it in a callback. And this callback is going to take in the text we want to update and it's just going to take our debounce text and it's going to update it. So just like this. All we're doing is we're just updating the text for our debounce text, and that's what we're passing as our callback to this function. Now inside of here, we need to do the logic to make sure that this callback is only called a limited amount of times. So first of all, we need to return it as a function because the way we're going to call this is we'll say update debounce text. And we're going to pass in that text just like that. So now this debounce needs to return to us a function, and this function is going to take in any amount of arguments. It doesn't matter. We want to make sure it's generic. Because if we have a callback that takes in 10 arguments, one argument, zero arguments, it doesn't matter. This is going to get all of the arguments. And inside of here, we want to set up that timer. So we're going to choose a set timeout for that. And this set timeout is just going to, inside of it, call our callback with our arguments. We're going to spread those out. And we're going to make sure we do wait for our delay. So by default, what this does is it's just forcing our function to wait one second before it actually runs. So if we save this and we just hit A here, you can see after one second, the text in debounce changes to A. If I change the text here, you can see after one second, each element is going to be putting itself in there. 
But that's not how debounce works. That's just delaying things by a second. We want to make sure all of those calls for the A, the S, the D, they actually don't run until we're done typing everything completely. So the way we do that is we just save a variable here for our timeout. So we'll set it to nothing by default. And then here we're going to say timeout is equal to this. And what I want to do is I just want to clear that timeout every time I call this function. So now what's happening is when I call debounce here, I'm running this function. I'm creating this timeout variable and I'm returning a new function. And inside this function, I'm just clearing out our current timeout and creating a new one. So every time that my input changes, I call this update function. And this update function clears my original timeout and starts a new one second timer. So as long as there's less than one second delay between calling this function, it'll never do anything. It waits until there's at least a one second delay before it actually runs. So let's take a look at that. If I type in something, and I make sure that there's never a second delay. I always type things quick enough. Now if I wait a second, you can see that that function runs and it ran just one time. It updated all the input at once. Same thing if I just start deleting things, as long as I don't have more than a second delay, it's going to wait until there's a delay and then it's going to call that function. This is really important because again, if you're fetching from an API, you don't wanna fetch every single time they type a character like we're doing in this default here. We wanna wait till they're done typing and then we make that fetch. So you might make this delay shorter. You know, for example, we could change the delay here to like 250 milliseconds. Now, as long as there's a 250 millisecond delay, it's going to make that API request. And it's not going to really be noticeable to the user, but it'll drastically increase the speed for them because they're not having to make 10 requests if you type 10 characters. And it's going to save you a lot of money because you won't have 10 requests hitting your server. So debouncing is really useful in these scenarios where you have an autocomplete that you need to do where like people are typing in things. Essentially, debounce is great when you want to make sure you do one request after everything is changed. Like if you have a bunch of changes happening all at once, you can kind of batch them up and send them all off at once with the debounce. Throttle, on the other hand, is a little bit different than debounce. Throttle works where it delays your function call, but instead of waiting until everything is done, what Throttle does is it says, okay, as soon as you make a change, I'm going to send off a request. And then every single second, if that's your delay, I'm going to continually send a new request based on whatever the last input was. So in the Throttle example, let's say I type S, it's going to send a request. And then let's say I type F, D, S, A, or E, and then after that it's been one second, now it's going to send this. And if I just continue typing after one second, it's going to send whatever the new value is. And again, after one second, it sends the new value until there are no more changes. This is great where things are changing a lot and you want to be able to just make sure you send the most recent request. So for example, if you're resizing a window or you're doing scrolling, it's really useful to do throttling in that case because you don't really want to wait until they're done resizing or done scrolling. You want to figure out where they are as you're going, but you don't want to call that method 100,000 times because scrolling and resizing, they make a lot of event calls. So by using throttle, you can limit the amount of power that the CPU needs to use in order to execute all of them because you're slowing them down. It's a little bit complicated, but let me show you exactly how it works and it'll be much easier to understand. So we're gonna create another function called throttle and it's gonna work exactly the same. We take a callback and a delay, which by default, we're going to set to a thousand. And we'll get rid of that 250 millisecond delay up here so we can really compare these. Now we need to call that throttle function by saying, we'll say, this is update throttle text. And we're gonna call throttle and it's gonna take in that text and we're gonna change this to our throttle text and then we're just going to call that function down here with our target value. So now all we need to do is actually implement our throttle. And there's two main ways to implement it. I'll show you the easier way and then the more complex way second. So with a throttle, the main thing that's different from debounce is debounce waits until there's been a second delay before it runs. And with throttle, it runs immediately when you call the function. So let's return our function, which has our arguments, just like we did with our debounce. And what we want to do inside of here is we want to immediately call the function as soon as we execute it. So we're going to call our callback with our arguments. That's the very first thing we're going to do. And then what we want to do is we want to say, hey, you know what? Now we need to wait one second or whatever our delay is until we call this function again. So we're going to create a set timeout. And this set timeout is just going to be set to that delay, which in our case is one second by default. And inside of here, we're going to set a variable. This variable is called should wait. We can call whatever we want. And we're going to set that to false. And what this variable does is say, hey, if we're within this waiting period, this variable will be true, which means don't call the function. So in our case, what we're going to do here is we're going to say if should wait, then we just return. So by default, should wait is false. So this is not going to return. It's going to call our callback function. Then we want to set should wait to true. So we'll set it to true here. And then we want to wait one second or whatever our delay is. And after that, we set our should wait equal to false. So the way that this works is the first time we call throttle, it immediately calls our callback function. And then every other time that we call it, it does nothing. 
until our delay has finished. Once our delay has finished, this should wait gets set back to false, which means it no longer returns here. It calls the function, again forces you to wait, and you have to wait another second. So let's see how throttle works here. If I type in S, you see immediately throttle gets that input of S right away, while the debounce takes a second. But if I start typing in a bunch of characters, you can see that throttle is getting it, and every second it's updating that value, but you'll notice something a little bit interesting about throttle. If I just type in like ASDF, you can see throttle gets just the A, but it's not getting the S, D, and F portion. And that's because we didn't have another event happen after one second. All of these events happened within one second. So the very first event got ran with this callback, but none of the other events got ran afterwards. So we need to actually tweak our throttle method a little bit to make it more advanced so that it will save whatever the last call to it was and send that out after that one second. That way you make sure you get this other information into it. So in order to handle that, we need to add a new variable. We'll call this waiting args. And this waiting args is going to be the argument for the function that we call when we're actually waiting. So if should wait is true, what we need to do in here is take our waiting arguments and set it equal to those args, and then we return. So now what we're doing is every time we are in the waiting stage, we're saving whatever the last call to the function was. We're saving those arguments so that we can call the function later with those arguments. Then this part is fine right here. The next part with our set timeout needs to change though, because what if we have waiting arguments that we need to take care of? So what we can do in here is we can take our waiting arguments. If it's equal to null, that means that we don't have anything waiting to happen. So we can just treat this exactly like it was before, where we can set our should wait equal to false, and then it'll wait until the next response before anything happens. This is great if you have like one event that happens and then three seconds later a new event, this is gonna work just fine. Then what happens though if we make two calls? So for example, if we come back in here and I type in AS, you would notice it prints out the A, but it doesn't print the S out. And that's because we made two calls. The first one came in, nothing happened. The second one came in, we're saving that to our waiting arguments. So what we need to do is if we have waiting arguments, I wanna call our function after that second with those waiting arguments. So we'll spread those out just like this. Then what I wanna do is set our waiting arguments equal to null. So that way we don't save that information anymore. And then I wanna just restart our timer because we already called it. We need to restart our one second timer. So I'm gonna take this function right here I'm just going to put this into its own variable. We're just going to call it timeout func, just like that. And then what I can do is just call set timeout inside of here, pass it our timeout func and our delay. And what I can do down here is the same thing. So in order to explain exactly what's going on here is we're saving the last call that we made after we made a call. So we called the throttle, it ran just fine. When we call it once, nothing changes. It works just like a normal call. If we call it a second time during this waiting period, it saves that call and it says, hey, you know what, you called this function, I'm going to execute this as soon as the delay is over. So that way you don't send more than one call per second in our case. So it's waiting, it's waiting, it's waiting, it's finally done waiting, it's saying, hey, we have some waiting arguments, call it with those waiting arguments and start your wait over again for the next one. So now with that done, we just type in ASD, you'll see that it's going to work. And we'll just do it a little bit different here. I'll type in really quickly ASDF, and you can see, I guess I was a little too quick. We'll wait for this, wait a full second. ASDF, or AS, you can see it prints out the A, that worked fine, and then after a second delay, it printed out the S as well. It's making sure to catch that last call and always send it every time. That's really important to make sure you do with throttle. Now this example that we're covering right here really isn't that useful for throttling because this is something you'd want to handle with debounce, but I mentioned a few use cases like resizing, but another one is mouse movement. If you want to track the mouse movement, that function gets called all the time. So you may want to throttle that so it doesn't call it quite as often. So let's set up a really simple event. We're just going to say document, add event listener, and this event listener here is just going to be for mouse move. So every time we move our mouse, this event's going to get called. And all I want to do in here is I want to increment a number between zero and whatever for how many times this function has been called. So all I want to do is I'm going to scroll down here. I'm going to paste this function. It's called increment count. We pass it an element and all it's going to do is increment the count for that function. And it's going to tell us how many times default has been called, debounce has been called, and throttle has been called. So we can just say here, increment count of our default text. And now, as you can see, as I move my mouse, you can see just by moving my mouse a little bit, we've already called this function 354 times. That is insane that depending on how much code you have inside this function, it could really slow down, especially slower devices. So let's look at what happens when we do debouncing and throttling. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy this, scroll up here to where we implement these update functions. I'm going to replace the implementation for these functions. So here we're going to increment our debounce 
text. And here I'm going to increment our throttle text, just like that. And this entire section with the input, we don't need that anymore. We can just get rid of that. So now when we update our throttle and debounce text, we're actually just incrementing those values. So we can call update debounce text and update throttle text, just like that. And now if I come over here and move my mouse, you can see throttle is getting called once every single second. Our default is getting called obviously every time we move our mouse and debounce, it's waiting until there's been an entire second between when I move my mouse and the next time I move it. So if I pause and don't move my mouse, now you can see debounce gets called once. And obviously in our case, you'd probably wanna increase the frequency of our throttle. So maybe make it like every 10 milliseconds. And then when we move, actually maybe like every 100 milliseconds would be fine. There we go. So now when I move, you can see that this is only being called 10 times a second, which for most use cases is probably fine. Instead of being called, you know, 796 times, it's only being called 58. So with throttling, you can do things like mouse movement for drag and drop. You can do things like resizing, scrolling. Those are really good use cases for throttling where you want to make sure you're sending out requests, but you don't want to send them out too quickly because it could slow down devices, slow down your API and so on. Now, if you enjoyed this video and want to see how to implement debouncing in React, I have a full video on that. It's going to be linked over here. And if you want to see a project that's the perfect use case for debouncing, I have a search bar project also linked over here in JavaScript. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.